I was a member of the organizing committee that, um, that um, put this event together. And when we first started meeting, we had some big, big ideas about who to invite. And as you can see, we got some, some really impressive speakers. But we had even bigger ideas. Um, we thought Paul Hawken, or the administrator of the EPA, or, or um, um, you know, people of that nature. And, um, and somebody threw out during a brainstorming session, what about climate change? We've got to get climate change in here some, somehow. And, um, and so we invited all of these people, and most of them turned us down. And we, we tried to come up with facilities to accommodate climate change, but um, we weren't able to actually fit climate change in here. But climate change did send us an email and a couple of, a couple of images to look at. And so um, I'd just like to read this on behalf of climate change. Hello, fellow Earthlings, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. I don't get to speak at many conferences, so I really appreciate this opportunity. I suppose I should feel honored by all these conferences you're organizing about me, but I just as soon it wasn't necessary. Still, I love interacting with teachers and students. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that education for humans is incredibly important. So again, thank you for the invitation, and let's get down to it. I don't know how many of you can hear me, fellow Earthlings, but we've got a situation here. I've been around for a long time, and like, I'd like to share my long perspective. I used to be just climate, anthropogenic climate change, is a new title and it's a really new experience for me compared to all but a few of the really new things that I've seen in the history of our planet. Take life. Life was a really new thing. The appearance of life on Earth four billion years ago was one of the happiest eons of my career. <laughs> Up until then, my existence was very boring get restless and really hot. And it had to do with planetary genesis and, and geology, not biology. The Earth's atmosphere was choking with carbon dioxide, thousands of parts per million of it. So it was a great thing for me when photosynthesis started to solidify sunlight and water and carbon dioxide and oxygen replaced carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This led to the first big extinction event of Earth's history. Extinctions aren't my favorite part of the job, but anaerobes turned out to be not such good company after all. Plants were much more interesting, and the oxygen they made eventually allowed other forms of life to develop, like you humans. Time passed, and a lot of those plants got buried under sediment and rock instead of being eaten by something. The carbon in those plants turned into the most copious and concentrated kind of chemical energy allowed on Earth by the periodic table of the elements. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but now I see that fossil fuels turn out to be a decidedly mixed blessing for you humans. Of course, change isn't a new thing for me, and I have changed a lot over the ages but mostly pretty slowly. I just respond to the laws of physics, and lots of things affect how I behave. Volcanoes and the carbon dioxide and dust they spew, orbital wobble, sunspots, meteors, more extinctions, regrettable. It's one of the reasons this new, much more rapid change has me worried. It took a while for the atmosphere to settle down, but by the time you humans came along, the waste products of life were balanced by photosynthesis in the oceans and on the land. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere had been pretty stable for millions of years when you showed up. As I say, I love teachers and students, and I loved how even before you formed civilizations 10,000 years ago, you began to teach and learn from each other. This ranked right up there with the appearance of life itself in my book. 
It's not unique in nature, but it's one of the things that defines you humans. Teaching and learning, how to avoid danger, how to grow crops, how to form civilization itself, how to live a good life. It was exciting to watch. What you've taught about and learned about has changed over the centuries, sometimes quickly, but mostly slowly. Unlike me, humans have free will, and there were some dark times. You formed your first institutions of higher education some 750 years ago, making teaching and learning more efficient and widespread. This eventually chased away the dark times, mostly. As I say, we've got a situation here, and I've been trying to understand how we got to this point, how you got us to this point, really. It started about 250 years ago when James Watt, working at the University of Glasgow, figured out how to improve the machines that released the ancient sunlight and water and carbon dioxide from coal. The coal came from those same plants that grew so long ago, and now it was possible to use that ancient energy to drive chemical reactions and to replace human labor. It took only a few generations for this technology to spread around the world. You humans were pretty happy about all this, at least those of you who benefited from it were. I should have known you'd eventually figure out how to use all that ancient solar energy. And now I was concerned. And for the first time in millions of years, I noticed a real increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it wasn't a good feeling. Once Watt figured out the steam engine, it was only a very short matter of time before cars and everything that goes with them were invented. From steam engines to the automobile to the airplane, just like that, all using fossil fuels. You humans were really eating this up, but by this time I was getting genuinely alarmed. These things were all, are all very new, even the way you humans measure time. Imagine what they look like to me. One thing I've noticed is that changes in climate kind of like changes in human technology or emotions, come to think of it, are not linear. Small changes can lead to rapidly escalating larger changes. That's what appears to be in store for us, since you haven't been able to deal with your addiction to fossil fuels. We've had only a few million years, actually only one million years, to get acquainted. So I don't really understand you humans but I can imagine this is discouraging news. On the bright side, look at what you have done in the 30 years since the first solid modern paper on climate change and carbon dioxide was published. You've turned cancer from a death sentence to in some cases a chronic or even curable disease. The same for HIV AIDS in an even shorter amount of time. You've maintained food production ahead of population growth. And you went to the moon more than 40 years ago. So it's true that you haven't made much progress on greenhouse gas emissions. OK, you haven't made any progress on greenhouse gas emissions. But your track record is still pretty promising. It looks to me like your main job is going to be education, even more than in the past. As I change, it's going to affect every single thing in your world. One of the problems is that the effects of climate change don't have just one disciplinary home in academia. So education in response to climate change will need to be interdisciplinary. And that's hard to do at most colleges and universities. For teachers, I don't really have answers, only questions. Do you think education matters? If education matters, should it respond to climate change? If so, how? If not, why not? How does climate change affect your thinking 
about how to live a good life. What is ethical and moral behavior when climate change will affect not just your grandchildren's and your children's lives, but your own lives, almost no matter how old you are now? What you will you say you were teaching in the year the temperature in Chicago hit 86 degrees F in March for the first time in recorded history? How about the year after? How do the books you use for teaching handle climate change? It's a human tendency, but when you're scared or alarmed, you tend to cling to the familiar. There's fundamentalism in every field, and academia turns out to be a surprisingly conservative place. Do you love your students more than you love the traditions of your disciplines? For students, I have a couple of observations. Looking back over a few hundred years of American education history, some of the biggest changes in education have come because students insisted. Sometimes students demonstrated and made lots of noise. Sometimes they just voted with their feet. As I change, there will be new things to learn and teach in every area, and it will be an exciting time, to say the least. It would be best to get going on this. I've had a 250-year head start, after all. I'm counting on you guys, you curious, Inventive, optimistic, can-do humans. I'm having nightmares. Sometimes I wake up thinking I've turned into Venus. Remember that you can't do it alone. Trying to do it alone can be worse than not doing anything. And not doing anything isn't really an option. I'm here. I'm climate change. Thank you. <laughs>